Hello everyone, I'm Nishan from Verite Research. Recently, we launched a campaign uh, with a hashtag called Ask Verite. My team collected a bunch of questions that you presented and they've thrown that at me. Uh, and here I am to try and answer them in a short while. I think we'll just dive into the questions. The first question comes from a handle called Morris Vera. And the question is, why is there external debt? I think behind that question, perhaps, is the deeper question, why don't we just spend our own money? Why do we borrow from other countries? The reason has two parts to it. One is that you take debt to invest. And there is a ratio that economists use called the incremental capital output ratio where we try to measure how much GDP growth you get for the investment you make. So let's say roughly if Sri Lanka invests about 30% of its GDP, you get about 6% GDP growth. That means an ICO of five. For every five units of GDP you invest, you get one unit of growth. So growth is about 20% of your investment. Now, the reason to borrow is if the domestic markets are not saving, the government and the people in the country are not saving a lot, then to grow your GDP, it can help you to borrow from outside and actually invest to grow your economy. So just like a business, you need investment to grow your business and the growth of your business is enough to offset the cost of borrowing, governments have to think the same way and say, if the GDP growth we get, and every time the GDP grows, the tax revenue grows, then borrowing can make sense because it helps the economy grow and you actually spend less on servicing that loan than what you're getting in return. So that is the basis for government borrowing. But why borrow externally? So I said one can be because your own domestic market is not saving. People are not saving to lend to government. Government is also not saving. But there can be another reason outside the lack of savings. It is if the cost of borrowing locally is quite high. So the other side of the coin, if people are not saving a lot when the government tries to borrow from them, then they will only lend to government at very high interest rates. But maybe in other parts of the world, people are saving a lot more and they're willing to lend at a lower interest rate. So let me give an example. If, say, the, in the Sri Lankan market, the government is borrowing at around 15%, that's about what it's borrowing at right now often, and in the outside world, the government can get a loan for, say, 5%. Now, the cost of servicing that external loan is not only the 5% that the government pays in interest, but also the depreciation of the currency, because ultimately it's the rupee cost that we have to measure, since locally it is a rupee cost, so we've got to convert it. So let's say you have a depreciation rate of 5%, a borrowing rate of 5%, then your total cost of that loan is 10% uh, if you borrow externally. But if you borrow internally, then you're paying 15%. So I'm not saying borrowing externally is cheaper, but it's a calculation you have to make. And if we had a professional debt management office, as we've often argued that Sri Lanka should, they would be making these kinds of optimizing calculations and saying, when is it better for Sri Lanka, given the international climate, given the local climate, to shift borrowing between local debt and external debt. And the goal should be to borrow as cheaply as possible and to invest it as productively as possible to grow the economy. So that is why there is external debt. Let me go to a question from the handle called at Sonur A. It says, could you explain debt restructuring in simple terms with examples? I will do it. I think many people have explained this quite simply and I will do it also. Uh, when we take a loan from anywhere, let's say a bank, um, Often, there can be a situation where we have to pay regular monthly interest. And then at the end of the period, let's say I've taken a two-year loan, uh, 
I've got to repay the capital too. Now, when you do debt restructuring, uh, let's, say the let's say you suddenly find it quite difficult to pay back your loan and you want the bank to restructure your debt, you can do it in three ways. One, you can tell the bank, look, I can keep paying your interest. That's not a problem. But you know, at the end of two years, I'm not going to be able to pay the entire capital. So if you don't mind, why don't you let me continue paying interest, uh, maybe not just for two years, but three years or four years. And by that time, I'll have collected the capital to repay you. So that's called reprofiling. That's part number one. Uh, where you simply delay the final payment, uh, but you continue to pay interest in the meantime. Now, is that good or bad for me or the bank? Well, it depends a little bit. If I have borrowed at a slightly low interest rate from the bank, then what I can borrow today, it's better for me and worse for the bank. Because if I paid them the whole capital early, they can lend it to someone at a high interest rate, but by allowing me to delay the capital repayment, they're going to suffer a lower interest rate for longer. So, so that's, that's debt restructuring that if you're the bank could be of benefit to you by reprofiling. The second way to do it, now you're going to be able to guess this quite easily, is I'm going to say, look, actually, I, I can pay you back the capital at the end of two years. I will get some money from somewhere else. But you know, right now it's quite tough. So in, if I was paying, let's say, 10 rupees a month in interest, I could go ask the bank, can I just pay 5 rupees a month in interest? And we call that a haircut on the coupon or interest payment. So that's a second way of restructuring. I don't delay the repayment. I'm going to make all the payments on time, but I'm going to take a hair, ask the bank to take a haircut or reduction in the interest payments I pay. The third way to do it then is the one way that is left which is, I tell the bank, look, you know, maybe I can continue to pay the 10 rupees interest, but come end of the term, I really cannot pay you your whole capital. So if I owe you 100,000 rupees back at the end of two years, would you consider taking just 80,000 instead of the whole 100,000? And that we say is a haircut on the face value on the capital that you have got from the bank. So these are three ways that you can restructure debt. That's why when you say restructure, you mean doing generally one of these, you know, one or a combination of these three things. You can ask to delay the payment, uh, even the interest payments or delay the capital payment. Uh, you can ask to do a haircut on the interest payment. You can ask to do a haircut on the principal payment. And often uh, a restructuring episode uh, results in you doing a combination of these things to increase the ability you have to repay the debt which otherwise you couldn't have paid. I'm going to get to the third question so I hope the, those two questions were clear enough. Um, at Word Countess is asking, currently do we get taxed on our EPF earnings? <clears throat> Great question because you know the EPF is managed for us by the central bank. Uh, we don't really have a lot of visibility on how that is managed, how that is invested, uh, and what happens to it. When the EPF Act uh, was originally formulated in the 1950s, um, actually there was no tax, and that is kind of normal. Uh, in most countries, or just about every other place I know, where you are forced to save for your old age, there is a tax incentive. So normally people try to either give you very, very low tax or no tax, uh, just to make it uh, beneficial or give you an incentive to actually put this money in a retirement savings in which you're being forced to do. So Sri Lanka's EPF had no tax. But somehow in 1989, I suppose the government felt that it was lacking revenue, uh, it introduced a 10% tax on the interest that you earned on your EPF member balances effectively. Then somewhere in 2016 or 17, uh, they increased that to 14%. So basically, uh, everyone who has money in their EPF earnings, when those earnings are invested in some way and often in government bonds, when they get their return or their interest or coupon payments, 
uh, they are charged a 14% tax. Now, is that high or low? Actually, it's high for some and not so high for others. For instance, currently in Sri Lanka, uh, if you are an individual who earns less than 183,000 something, maybe 300 rupees, you pay only 12% in taxes. Uh, in the past, it was even lower. So, but your money in the EPF is getting charged at 14%, which means if you had the money in your hand and you put it in a bank, you may have actually got a higher return because the EPF gives you poor returns often compared to other sources. Uh, but also, you're getting taxed at a higher rate. But if you, have, if you were a person earning more than 183,000 a month and maybe more than 300,000 a month, then tax-wise, this is advantageous to you to save in the EPF because in your hands, uh, if you earned it directly off the bank or in the market, then you might be paying a tax of 18, 24, 30%, whereas in the EPF, you're only paying 14%. So yes, you do get taxed, whether that's something you should be happy about or not so happy about, it depends on your earning level. Uh, if, you're, if you're a high earner, then maybe this isn't too much of a problem. At Mifi K asks, how does DDR affect the EPF? So uh, that's a little easier to answer now that I've answered the question about, uh, you know, what is uh, debt restructuring. Uh, it affects the EPF in at least two of the ways that I described. One is that there is, so here's what's going to happen. The government's going to say, well, I've issued you a bunch of debt or bonds, they call it, that is effectively that the government has borrowed a certain amount of capital from the EPF and is paying them at a certain interest rate. Um, and the government says, look, I'm going to take all those bonds I issued you and give new ones. Uh, and they've made this offer so we know what it looks like. And these new bonds are different to the old bonds in two ways. One is that they will be repaid at different times than the old ones. So some may have, you may have had bonds that matured early, maybe 2025, uh, 2028. Uh, but the government is giving you a structured set of bonds that may have a longer maturity profile so that it will take longer to get the money. Now, if you're the EPF, that's not much of a problem and it doesn't really matter if you have a reprofile. If the return to that investment is high or higher than what you have got with the bonds you had. So as you know, the government gave bonds at very high yields. So it's not just the interest rate, uh, a yield is the effective interest rate. And all, all throughout 2020 or to the later part of 2022, 2023, early parts, the, the return on government bonds were close to 30%. Of course, that's okay uh, for a fund like the EPF because inflation was close to 60%. So there has to, you have to get high returns to make up for the loss of real value in the money that you're holding with such high inflation. And if the EPF held these high return bonds for a few years over time, they would have made up for the loss of value of inflation. But if they are exchanged for much lower return bonds over a long duration, then the real value of what is collected in the EPF will decline substantially compared to what it was if you didn't do this debt exchange. So that's how the DDR affects the EPF, that the EPF, everyone who has money in the EPF today, uh, will end up collecting somewhat less in the future and, and our calculations say substantially less in the future, even though the central bank uh, says, no, no, it's going to be only a little less, uh, but really hasn't made the data or the calculations public, but using their own methods. I think our view is that there will be substantially less that people get in the future than if the DDR was not implemented. That's a little bit of financial and saving advice. I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion of Ask Verite that we've done for you today. And please feel free to explore the handle and send more questions whenever you want. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.